So today I actually read the entire paper um, about the that experiment where they were showing the lines and they would ask the person which one of these lines matches the line they showed. So basically the experiment, well, you read this in Cialdini, but this is just to make, uh, you know, just to get on the same page. The experiment is you are given, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you read this too in Cialdini, right? I don't think it was exactly that. I mean, he mentioned something um, like along these lines, lines, but uh, he didn't mention specifically. So I think you have more knowledge about this. Got it. So basically, it's an experiment on authority. Do people stand by and are confident in their own belief system or do they succumb to the majority? Or do they succumb to the authority, right? So in Cialdini, it's authority bias. No, actually, um, it was not mentioned in the authority Commitment? part. It was about the majority. Okay. Uh, it was about the society, how you want to fit. Social proof. Exactly. Was how you want to fit into the society. You don't want to be, even if you are sure you are correct about something, if the majority says, no, actually the different thing is correct, you feel at risk when you express your opinion. Got it. So it wasn't about the authority in okay. this particular one. Got it. So the book I'm reading right now, Sapolsky, I mean, the whole world knows now what I'm reading. So uh, Sapolsky, I talk about all the time and in Behave, and uh, the, ch the chapter is on hierarchy, compliance, and uh, something else. That's the chapter. And in the chapter is specifically, there's one section which talks about three experiments. The lines, the ones we're talking about right now, Stanford prison experiment, yeah. and the shock experiment, right? And the shock, the electric shock. So what's the difference between the second and the third? Stanford prison didn't require any shocks. It was a bunch of prisoners and a bunch of guards. Uh, we'll talk about that too. But basically it's, they took a bunch of students from Stanford and they said, this half will be prisoners and this half will be the guards. And you have to act like a prisoner and you have to act like a guard during these, I think it was oh, 14 day. It was a 14 day experiment. It was from the psychology department. What they did was they rented the basement of the psychology building and they had run, they ran this experiment in the basement. So basically, and they did it very good, like very well. They had the police, the Stanford local police, go to the individual prisoners, wherever they were, at a cafe or at the house, usually at the house, because they didn't want to be like, oh my God, they're getting arrested. So they would go to the person's house and they would arrest them, like, you know, put handcuffs and take them to for a deposition or whatever, uh, you know, read them the Miranda rights, you know, you have the right to remain silent, that whole thing. They took them to the police station they, they, you know, did a, 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 whatever it's called, like bookkeeping report. And then they took them to the basement of the, the Stanford building. And well, we, I guess we can talk about it now. Then we'll get back to the lines because this is a very cool experiment. And they even have a documentary about it. So what happened is the guards were just colleagues of the other guys. They were all students. They're college students, right? Yeah, I'm sure I, I have seen this. Uh, or read this, but it wasn't in the Cialdini's book that I uh, read recently. Got it. Got this it. one, no. The electric shock, yes. Got but it. this one, but I mean, yeah, you have to tell me because I'm not really sure. Yeah, basically what happened, and, and uh, it, it's a very, very detailed experiment, and I have, I have the papers here that I'm going to read this week. Is that the next video I'm doing is on how humans are evil and how the capability of being evil. You know, we have the capacity. So the, what, what the conclusion of this study or what, what happened in this experiment is that the prison guards made the prisoners shit in a bucket. They weren't required to. No, 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 no. This wasn't part of the rules. They made them shit in a bucket even though there were bathrooms on the floor where they can walk to. And... They did not empty the bucket. The bucket was in prison and the prisoners had to re-shit in there. For 14 days? No, 
This is a good question. The experiment was stopped at day six because it got so bad. Look, I got goosebumps. It got so bad. They didn't even expect that it would go like that. No. The extent to the evil nature of human beings was shown in the Stanford prison experiment. Because here's the thing, the guards is one matter, but the prisoners, they could have stopped at any time. But they didn't. They didn't stop. And they were all colleagues. They were all students. They were all college students, same age group, so on. And the students, there was one, because they were put, put in different cells and there were three people to a cell. One of the cells with like, the three people, they did a, like, a, like a petition, a riot, right? They put like certain, um, like a, a, some kind of object so the, the guards couldn't get in. Like they, they, they did like, a, you know, like a, when, when you, okay, we're not going to eat for, we're not going to eat, fuck off. We're not going to eat like that. And the guards got fire extinguishers and to them. And this happened in real life. And in the documentary, they show like, you know, how they would make a line and they would make people sit and they, they would, you know, tell them to do like really horrible things. What, what year was that? I don't know. Approximately? 60s or 70s. 60s or 70s. I can, I can actually look it up. Let me, let me uh, it's a good question. So it's um, the Stanford, 73. 1973 was when the paper was published. Mm. A study of prisoners and guards in a simulated prison. Um, was it before or after the electric shock experiment? Oh, good question. Let me show. Let me show this. Independence conformity. 1956 was the shock. Mm -hmm. Shock experiment. And and getting back to um, this one, the lines one. I have the paper right in front of me. I was reading it today. So, this one was published in Scientific American 1955. So the shock experiments and the line experiments were around the 50s. And this was around the 73. Um, the prison experiment was on in 73. But getting back to the lines, right? Because that was the first one. And we can get back to the prison too, because I really want to get your thoughts on this. In the lines experiment, you're shown two cards. One card is a line. And the second card is three lines. Now, of these three lines, one line is exactly the length of the first card's line. It's, they're yeah. identical. That's like whatever, A, B, or C. But the other two are different lengths. But one of the lines is more similar. And then the other line is just like completely retarded. Okay. Like it's not, it doesn't even make sense. And what happened is they would bring seven people into the the room and they would say, okay, uh, which one of, wh which one of these lines is identical to the first card pick. And out of those seven, six were hired by the experimenter. They were part of the group. It was like a, like a scam, right? Like they were part of it. And the seventh guy, he always answered last. This was key. And he just thought he was whatever. Unlike he didn't think. And the seventh guy, was the only one actually being tested, right? Yeah. So now to control, they did a bunch of experiments and they showed if everyone agreed, what would happen? The person made an error less than 1% of the time. This is general. Like if you did the test, I did the test, anyone in the, in the, in the world did the test, they would get it wrong less than 1% of the time. So at a 99% plus correctness, because it's so easy to, tell like yeah okay, you can even take those two cards and just compare it right that's it you can you i don't know if they were allowed to touch it but yeah i'm sure you could i'm sure you could so now what happened is they did something very clever the first six trials the person would have the same answer as the other six you know they wanted him to think it's not not a listen they're not he's not getting tricked right so the first six consented, like, you know, complied with the correct answer. But then after the first six trials, they did it wrong on purpose. Just wrong, wrong, completely wrong. 
and they have pictures of this uh, the guy uh, some examples in this paper where the, the in initially in the first six trials the guy is happy he's like oh we're all agreeing this is easy this is boring this is getting boring come on what what is this and then you see him looking back at the cards going like this thinking and what they found is the longer the experiment went on the more errors he made and they found that out of all they did they experimented with 123 people and what they found is around 75 percent yielded to the group at some point or another now there were 25 percent who were strong in their belief they never yielded right and then the experimenters went back and they asked why did you not yield like why why were you so arrogant in your choice so they gave some exam they gave some answers they're like well look i knew that the majority they were actually right i knew i was wrong but i couldn't lie like i couldn't actually lie i had to tell you what i was feeling what do you mean he knew they were right he thought that there was some error in his judgment okay because all six said it so but he's like i was unable to lie that oh they're actually right or or or, or you know i'm sorry like i he he there were some people who were just confident right they look this is what it is they didn't even think of the other people they're like okay this is the answer i don't care what they think so um i want to make sure i understand this correctly so the point was for the group to give one answer so they had to like discuss uh between themselves no discussion okay so like everybody just says what they think is the answer that's right there was no discussion at all so why think of it think of it like this let's say we are seven people and there's a question and answer it doesn't matter logic here a b c d e f they all say the other thing from what you believe that authority has so much power that now the question and answer doesn't matter you automatically assume oh they're right i mean th they cannot be wrong so do you think uh those people thought it was like the the people who were actually not like hired but real people participating in that experiment do you think uh they even cared to look at the lines or they were just like okay that's what everybody says or they looked at the lines and they were like oh these people are obviously wrong but i don't want to be weird i don't want to be the only one who says this that was also one of the answers what you just said that was because this was um they they in the paper they don't show a statistically uh they, they don't do the statistics on the answers like the, the 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 data we have but the interview question answer the survey question answer wasn't like there was no stats on it but there are and there is anecdotal evidence where the guys like oh yeah i i you know these people are saying that but i just don't want to be the one i don't want to oh this is what someone says i don't want to mess up the data i don't want to mess up the experiment i wanted the experiment to go smoothly so instead of me like if i if i said the the other thing maybe you guys won't get what you want so there are some people who cared for the experimenters interesting yeah and the reason i brought this up at the very beginning is because i want to get your thoughts on from your own life right from your own first hand experience have there been moments in which you were against the majority you had a certain belief in you and maybe you didn't express it but you felt that something was not right there was some maybe injustice some ill treatment something unfair and maybe you went on with it right 
or you said, no, enough is enough. This is what I believe. I'm not sure. I don't really recall any particular moment in my life that would make me like think of what you just said. Let me put it another way. There are moments in our life where when we look back, we say, oh, oh shit. If I knew what I know today, when I was, when I used to be in that group, I would have said something. If there was an injustice going on, I would have spoke up and said, hey, why are you doing that? Why are you, why are you treating her like that? Why are you treating me like that? And specifically, because I know one, one thing I know for sure is, I mean, you spent five years in vet school, right? Five and a half. Five and a half years in vet school. So finishing vet school and looking back during in that five and a half years, are there any moments during that time in which if you know what if you knew what you know now today in who you are, the amount of confidence you have, the self-respect you have, were there any inc incidences where you would speak up and not take the situation for what it was? For sure, there are moments like that, but uh, it's not so much about speaking up and acting in a certain way when I'm in a group, but more about what I was thinking at that time, what was going on, what was happening inside me, you know? Like, for example, I had so much fear in me at that time, which I don't have now. And uh, also, I was just unable to live in the present. And I was always stressing out like, oh, I'm going to have this exam. Oh, this is going to happen. And I was constantly thinking about what's going to happen. Am I going to pass this exam? Like, this is so stressful. And uh, I just couldn't stop and be in the moment. So it's not so much about how I'm acting towards people, but how I was treating myself. Okay. So you're not, you're not looking at it from how they acted towards you. You're looking at it you're seeing it independently of how you react to situations. So you would have reacted different. Yeah, I think, I think so. If I could have the brain that I have right now, it, if I could have the feelings that I have right now, it would have been different for sure. But um, I don't really think about what was happening around me externally. It's more about the inside, way more about the inside. Got it. Sometimes the external environment turns on genes on the inside, right? Gene environment interaction. And in the lines study, what they showed is when there's a partner, right? So they injected a partner and they told the partner, do the right guess. He was also hired. But do the right guess. Don't, don't be like the other five. So there are still seven people. Now five are doing the wrong uh, answer. And one is the, the innocent guy. And now he has a partner. And guess what happened? So what did the partner say? The partner would choose the right answer. They wanted to see what would happen to confidence if you had someone like you. If he did the same answers as you, would you now be more confident? I think so. Yeah. Incredible results. With the partner there, the errors went to 25% of what they were. And, I mean, obviously, there were still errors. He was, he, he was still like, he was still... Um, dissuaded by the, the majority. 
he was still like influenced by the majority. But he was way more confident. Yeah. Way more. Yeah. Only 25% errors. Now, what they did was they had the guy for the first few trials, like six trials, right? Again, six trials. He would answer with the, the innocent guy. And then he went to the majority. The partner. They, so they fucked like that. So what happened? He became he had the errors again. <laughs> Just like normal. So having the partner with you is great until he leaves. Then you're back to where you were. See? And then they did another study. They had the partner stay for six times. And then he would go to the majority. He got called by the dean. You know, so he had to leave. He wasn't even part of the group anymore. Then guess what happened? I guess the guy was still confident in his answer. He was. Not as confident as the partner was still there, but he yeah. was way more. And didn't change his mind. So having a partner is great until he changes to the other side. Mm. This is huge. This is a huge thing. And so in your life, you know, you mentioned that it's like how you react to your own environment inside. Can you give examples of, if any, where having someone that believed the same thing you believe at least one person. We can start with vet school, right? If you had a certain belief, you, you, you believed in a certain thing, or you wanted to study for a test, or you, you, know, you, you wanted to not party that night, or whatever it was, right? Were there any accountability partners or any, any of those friends who helped your family that was like, that was your anchor to have that confidence? I don't think so. I mean, I have... no, that doesn't resonate with me at all. Yeah. Like I, I can just think about it. Yeah. So that, so that means there, because from, from the majority of people in the world, from what I see, and, and this Lines experiment, the Stanford prison experiment and the shock experiment, they basically tell us about how hard it is to stand by your ground, right? S stand your ground. Because the tribe that we live in, we want the tribe to flourish. We want the tribe to be happy. We want the betterment of the collective. And even when we really, really believe something, we don't stand by it. We just give in. And this is, this is something very interesting because, you know, I've seen transformations in you firsthand, right? And a lot of those transformations is, it makes me very happy. It, it, it gives me a lot of pleasure to see that, oh, a person can literally change their brain wiring through repetition through following a step-by-step, -step, but doing it as a habit. So, so the next thing I want to ask you is, have you felt any transformations inside you, in your heart, in your mind, which can help other people who are struggling with a certain... Um, something that is very hard for them to overcome. Definitely, I've had a lot of these. So <laughs> I don't even know what to start with. But first of all, just caring about my health way more than I used to in the past. I feel like this is the biggest thing because without our health, we don't have anything else, right? So making this my number one priority and uh, basically just not caring about anything else. Just making sure I'm okay 
making sure I'm fine. And then I can maybe focus on other things. So this was probably the biggest transformation in my life. What sacrifices have you? Maybe they're not, maybe sacrifice is not the right word, but what, what have you, what does a person or you in this case must give up in order to get on a, on the right track of being healthy? Are there certain major, um, belief systems or substances or any day-to-day thought processes that need to be set aside? Yeah. First of all, I would say sleep, uh, establishing a healthy sleeping habit, probably top one thing that I did that benefited me. Um, another thing is a healthy diet, uh, because I used to not even look at the ingredients of uh, the food I was eating. And uh, when I used to work a lot, I didn't even have time to cook. And I just uh, ordered anything on Uber Eats or uh, when I was already living in Tulum, I just went to a random restaurant and uh, I never cared what was in there. If it's like carbs, if it's protein, if it's, uh, you know, whatever. I just wanted to satisfy my hunger. And uh, that's it, right? So just becoming conscious about what you put in your body and that it matters and that it affects your entire life. That's a huge change. Um, I would also say social media is one of the things that I am currently struggling with and uh, I I don't have it figured out yet, I would say, but um, I'm doing my best every day to use it less and less. Yeah. I would say these three are probably the most important things. And also uh, addictions, right? Which social media is also an addiction. Um, unhealthy eating habits also might be considered addictions. If you're, for example, eating a lot of uh, sugar and sweets. So yeah, that's it. One activity that I know very well that you love to do and do a lot is read stoicism and uh and and you told me earlier it's you know you you kind of touched stoicism back in in high school and they um i mean i'm so happy that in poland they actually have this type of uh, subject in the curriculum because in america canada there's no way yeah i think it was like i don't know um a few weeks uh we did that which was really awesome and uh I didn't pay that much attention to that, but still I remembered that. I remember what exactly we studied, and uh, but now it has a tremendous impact on me compared to what it was like before. Yes, yeah, so someone, because when I first um, touched Stoic philosophy, I was also like, wow, this Obstacle is the Way is my favorite book of all time. It changed my entire life. Just reading that one book just changed the entire course of my life. When I, uh, I listened to it, I think last year, around this time last year, and, um, I didn't feel like it's a life changing book, maybe because I was already familiar with these concepts, right? Because when you read that first time, you weren't really familiar with the stoic philosophy, right? Not at all. Okay. I knew nothing. That's fine. I knew nothing about it. Like Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, like. I had no idea. And Ryan Holiday is the one who, I mean, that's all I knew. All right. So he would mention Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, and eventually I would read those guys too. But for me, it was just getting a recommendation to read Obstacle is the Way, and then I read it. And also, you know, there's this concept of reading a book with an intention, right? I read Obstacle is the Way as in a very intentional way. Like I was hungry 
for an answer. Mm. Because I read the, the, the title, Obstacle is the Way, and I'm like, damn, I have a lot of obstacles. Obstacle is the way? And also, I, I would also argue that it depends on personality, right? Someone with a different mindset would not care about stoicism so much. It wouldn't resonate with them. Like you and I, we, we see how it, we can feel stoicism because it also pertains to our personality. Yeah, but it's also what I mentioned, the consciousness. At some point, you become aware that, you know, there's more to life than just being stuck in this cycle of work, eat, sleep, party, and make money. At some point, I believe everybody, or I would hope everybody will realize that there's something more. You got to go deeper, no? Hey. When you read Stoicism, talk about your habits. Like, what books do you love in this, in this topic? What have you learned? And what do you recommend someone do who is searching for a philosophy or a way of life that will fulfill them and not have them chase money all the time? Well, right now I'm uh, reading uh, Epictetus and uh, I think it might be the best that I have read so far, even though I'm already, I'm just starting with this, but it's already affecting me tremendously. So if somebody is starting out I would probably recommend this one, even though I cannot be really sure because uh, I'm only getting started. But um, Seneca is great. I read the on the shortness of life and the letters from a stoic, right? That's that's what it's called. Um, it's great, but there is a lot of things that are maybe difficult to understand. If you're like searching for, uh, if you're looking to find like the way to live, I would say the letters from a Stoic maybe are not the best position to start with. And I know how you mention uh, meditations all the time, but I haven't uh, read this one. Uh, I will do it after Epictetus, uh, but I think, uh, from the quotes that I saw that you selected uh, that were your favorite and also you showed me a few uh, pages, I, I think it might be also a great one, but I can say anything more because I haven't read it. Got it. In terms of habits, right, we go back to habits here. One thing I've learned is having a ritual every day is very beneficial to being having a free life. You know, living a life full of freedom. And it's like discipline is freedom. This is one of those things. So I know that you love to keep a schedule. And you are gung-ho about scheduling, right? I know there's, of course, there's flexibility and all that. But some one thing I see you do every day is you're scheduling. You know, you're writing down this time, this time. And from what you taught me when we were in Merida, I was also scheduling, you know, I would write it on the whiteboard every day, yeah. scheduling. And I scheduled for a couple of months and then I stopped scheduling, right? I don't schedule now. So the conclusion I've come to is uh, if you do the same thing every single day, then there is no schedule because it's the same thing, right? So now I feel like I have the type of rituals every day which are exactly the same, and I don't need to schedule. A little bit maybe would help, but I'm not doing it. Why? Because the personality that I feel I have is not someone who schedules, mm. right? It's like, uh, it just feels weird to me. And I tried it for those two months. I tried it like very, very steadfast. So talk about this. like. Does the scheduling really help you? How do you organize that? Um, do you do like to-do lists or checklists? So I used to do to-do lists a lot when I was studying, when I was working. Uh, I started with the to-do lists, 
but then it naturally evolved to adding the time slots to this uh, to-do list um, only f for the things for work I needed to do or whatever I needed to study for uh, in my vet school. But then um, I read uh, Cal Newport Deep Work and I believe uh, he mentioned in this book that you should keep the schedule. Uh, like uh, you should basically have a plan for every minute that you uh, spend working. And I also uh, try to do it with other things that uh, I do in my life. So not only work, not only study, but uh, basically, you know, even shower at this time, uh, make breakfast at this time, go to the gym at this time. And uh, it helps me a lot. It helps me to be disciplined, which I have this kind of personality that it's easy for me to get distracted if I don't, if I am not strict with myself. So I just want to treat myself like this little kid that I have to take care of. And it's like uh, my higher self is uh, like organizing the curriculum for my lower self, because I know like the, the lower self, it can make mistakes. It can like uh, just go on Instagram and to spend an hour doing like uh, stuff that don't really matter, right? So this is my way to keep myself accountable and keep myself disciplined and get things done, things that really matter and make a difference. So I want to revisit um, certain aspects of vet school with you. Today, when we were at Jungle Gym, we saw the ants, right, going the tree, and it was something super beautiful. And um, it was basically these little leaves that all the ants were carrying, and we could see them on a tree all the way down, trickling like that. They were going down like this, and then they were walking, God knows, to the forest somewhere. So studying veterinary vet medicine and going through those five and a half years of rigorous curriculum and experiments and uh, your your fellowships and internships and all that stuff. Is it, how, how, how does the love of animals play into that? Because a lot of people go into careers and jobs and activities which they don't really feel good about. It's like something in demand. Or like, you know, right now AI is like in demand. Or um, social media uh, management is in demand, right? So how did you choose that field, right? It'll, it'll, it'll give me a perspective on how to choose what you want to do in life. And how much of a, how much does love for the thing you're doing play a role in how good you are at it? Well, ever since I can remember, I was always very interested in animals. Just like the ants we saw today, I was always looking at the insects, at like uh, small animals, uh, dogs, cats, uh, and uh, then uh, we started uh, to actually, we started uh, professional uh, dog breeding um, with my parents. So I was going to dog shows with my dogs and I was like uh, learning how to, uh, you know, showcase, showcase the dogs. And uh, naturally this kind of interest, it evolved into veterinary medicine because I knew that I want to work with animals. I want to be with animals. It gives me joy. And, uh, when we were having puppies or, you know, we had like four, five, six dogs uh, as a family. So we would go to a veterinarian quite often. So me seeing that, it was a huge inspiration. And uh, basically when I turned I think 13, 14 years old, I already knew what I wanted to do, which I don't think was the right choice after all, because... After knowing 
what I already know. I feel like I would fit more into the field of like ethology and uh, animal behavior rather than uh, medicine because I am more fascinated by how animals behave and how we can interact with them um, if we can rather than treating sick animals and like using medicine. You know what I mean? So um, I feel like many, many people go study veterinary medicine because they love animals. But then during the course of uh, the study, you realize that this is not actually uh, what really matters in that profession because you need to have like certain personality type to be a good doctor uh, as with a normal medical doctor, right? So. I feel like I've realized uh, I don't really have what it takes and uh, I didn't really have a desire to be a vet, you know? So even though I love animals and I am really fascinated by them even today, I don't think this is the right path for me. And uh, I feel like many people realize that. Like uh, the love for animals is not is not that, you know? You need to have something else. So that's something else. Let's compare a doctor with an ethologist, right? So a, a vet medicine doctor practicing, curing sick animals in the clinic versus someone like a Sapolsky yeah. studies primates or, you know, so there's many primatologists like Franz de Waal is one of them studying chimps. What personality type would be more fit for a medicine doctor? And what personality type would be more fit to someone who studies behavior? Well, uh, first thing I can think about is if you want to be a doctor, you need to be proactive. You need to want to take action because you want to cure a sick animal, right? You want to treat animals, so you got to take action. And if you are an ethologist, I would imagine, because I'm, I'm not an ethologist, but I would imagine that you need to enjoy observing and uh, drawing conclusions from your observations and not necessarily uh, interacting with the animals and uh, like doing something to them, like curing them, doing experiments. I would say it's more about paying attention and uh, drawing conclusions from what you are seeing. How much of a parallel can you draw with talking and listening? So, for example, some people love to listen, right? Like listening to a podcast. People can listen for hours. Yeah. Whereas other people can listen. They need to talk. So you, for sure you've noticed, you'll be talking to someone and you can see in their face that they want to say something. Yeah. And they have no idea what you're talking about. Exactly. Because they're already uh, processing what they're going to say. Yeah. I think it happens to all of us. It does. Is that a good parallel? So, for example, someone who's an ethologist, an observer, and you probably don't even want to interact with the animals because you can mess something up. Exactly. So you just sit there and you watch... And you write like um, uh, what's her, what's her name the 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 Jane Goodall, Jane Goodall. She has a master class. I watched her master class. She's the very world famous um, lady who did. She went to Africa and she studied. Um, I think it's chimpanzees or one of the. Oh yeah, I think I know the one you mentioned to me. The the crazy lady. Yeah, I mean she's amazing. She's so nice. She's so. Um, but yeah, she's definitely crazy uh, in a good way. So someone who does that versus someone who is writing prescriptions. Could you draw that parallel, a talker and a listener? To that, that uh, doctor and uh, ethologist, I wouldn't say that because when you're a doctor, you also need to listen very well. And uh, What are they? Yeah, they have to. They ha if they if you want to be a good doctor. I mean, like psychiatrists nowadays. I mean, we we know this. I mean, I talked to my uh, what is he? My cousin, 
it was a, a Sarah's, um, Sarah's like uncle somehow. So my like in-law mm. uncle, he's a psychiatrist in America. And he told me that they are, there is a limit of one hour of them seeing a patient. That's the maximum. They are not allowed. So in today's system, there is a list of prescriptions that are given, right? Like, you know what happened when my dad went to the doctor and he's like, don't come back unless you're going to do knee surgery or you're going to do steroid injections oh or you're going to do PRP injections. Like, do not come back to me. So are doctors really listening? Um, hard for me to say about the regular medicine doctors, but uh, as far as I know, in Poland... Veterinarians, um, they do listen and they uh, examine the animals. So I would say it's quite different than uh, the case you brought up with the psychiatrist. So you cannot draw that parallel? I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I'm still trying to get this. Because when I was in pre-med, destined to go towards the doctor field, and then I decided to not do that. You know, I did computer science and PhD and all that. Now that I look back and I see someone like my dad, who's a, who's a medical doctor, who was a medical doctor, now he's retired. Or I look at other people who are doctors, like Dr. Araujo, who we went to, right? Or Dr. Ortiz, like, you know, people who we know are doctors practicing or have practiced for the last, you know, 40 years. I see a personality of a doctor and I want to know what you, what do you see? Like what traits, because this is at, this is very important because there are certain traits which you would have, which would make you bad at X or Y or Z. So what traits would make you a bad vet medicine doctor? I would say if you want to be a good doctor, you have to... You need to know how to think logically, how to like connect the dots, you know, uh, seeing this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, then you know what kind of uh, diagnosis this could be or what kind of tests you need to run. Just a uh, quick judgment, you know, so a person who does not have that would be a bad doctor. That's what I would say. Maybe pattern recognition. That's that's it. <laughs> that's that's what I was looking for. Pattern exactly. recognition. Got it. You got it. Got it. So, and because in today's society, there are certain careers which are in demand, and then there's other career, other careers which those people starve because they are in the career, right? So. Simple example, someone who studies art, someone who's a musician, lots of those careers are, you know, people are broke. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They have many, many jobs they're working at. You know, they're, they're working at Starbucks or whatever just to get by and do their art. Then there's the other side of hard careers, right? Hard not hard, like difficult, but like phys something tangible, something like I'm a doctor, I'm a, I'm a pharmacist, right? I'm a lawyer. You're doing something that is tangible, right? Yeah. What type of personality would be fit for either of those two? Do you, so what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to ask is, could a good doctor also be a good musician? Like, could a good athlete also be a good lawyer yeah. like are there certain are, because because one thing is people it would be so great if everyone was able to live their gift in life yeah actually now that you mentioned that i would say that it all comes down to doing something you enjoy actually not even like if you have a talent because for example, I'm good at studying, uh, and I would imagine I could be a great vet because of that. But if I 
actually did that. Well, by the way, I still can because uh, I uh, I have the license to perform it in Poland. Um, but if I decided to do it at at any point, maybe in the future I could. But at, if I decided to do it right now, I would not be truly happy doing that. So that wouldn't make me necessarily a good doctor at this moment. But I would say... If you're a good doctor, you can be a good musician. If you're enjoying it, why not? And uh, I would say you can change your career to anything at any point in your life as long as you're capable of that. I would say there are, there is nothing that can stop you. What about when you want to do something and it's not practical? So, for example, there are people love music. They love to perform. They love to play the guitar. But they still need to survive. They still need to eat. They have to pay rent. Maybe they have a family to support. Sometimes what you love to do, it is not possible to do that. Right, right. But uh, you just can't have it all, ever. So look at your life and decide what kind of sacrifice you want and you are able to make. That's what I would say. And everybody's situation will be different. Like uh, the, the fact that I am able to do what I like doesn't mean that someone else will be able to do it because they may not be in such a position, such a, you know, will not have the good circumstances to do that. So always look at the situation, and then decide what kind of sacrifice you could make. Voluntary well, sacrifice. Exactly. So, you know, um, I imagine if you have a family to feed, it's not so easy, right? But there is always a way. So you're, you come from the principle of don't make excuses, find a way? Exactly. So let's talk about how you found it. When you were in Poland you had an opportunity to leave. When you were in Bydgoszcz, you had the opportunity to leave. A lot of people have opportunities. They take it, but most don't take it, right? Most stay where they are and they want to sort of be comfortable. Tell me about your journey because it was the first time you came to this part of the world, this the Western Mexico, US part of the world. How was it at that time? Describe that first moment you got the opportunity and the question that, hey, Martha, will you go and leave your family behind? Well, I was sure I would do that because at that point in my life, I really wanted to explore. Simple as that. Like I was not satisfied with uh, what I had at that time. And I had this kind of hunger to discover the world, you know? So I never had any issue with uh, leaving my family behind because I know they're always with me in my heart and uh, we stay in touch all the time. So I just felt like if I didn't take this opportunity, I would just be limiting myself and I would never know what awaits me on the other side, right? So, yeah, I never had any doubt. And I was just happy that I had the opportunity to do that. What if you didn't get the opportunity? Then you wouldn't come here? I'm sure I would do something to go somewhere, you know? Like, uh, I would be very proactive uh, in searching for this type of opportunities because I just wouldn't be able to keep doing what I'm doing uh, if I'm not truly happy with it. And that could involve living in a place. Exactly. Let's talk about the role of coincidence, synchronicity, right? Sometimes we get the thought that, hey, the world is against me. I can't take the next step. I don't have any opportunities. So are there signals and signs 
all the time in our environment, which we can be aware of if we have the recognition and awareness inside our body of those things? And how has that played a part in your life? Do you, has, for example, has Tulum played a part in that aspect of your life? Or you also had these feelings back in Poland? Uh, for sure, I felt a lot more of this like spirituality vibe in Tulum compared to Poland. Um, I would want to touch upon victim mentality instead, because you mentioned like, uh, do I have any opportunities? Maybe I don't have any opportunities. Like uh, maybe I'm just unlucky and I have to stay where I am. I feel like uh, this is uh, a kind of like a victim mentality, uh, which just keeps you stuck. And um, I would say this is one of the big factors that we have to be aware of. If we don't recognize our power that we have, then I feel like this is a huge problem. Have you experienced victim mentality? Oh, for sure. For sure. Many times in my life, I had these thoughts like, uh, oh, I wish I had a better life. I wish I had this or that, but I don't have it. Like, uh, I, I was, I, I was just not gifted that opportunity, you know? So I guess I have to live with that. And uh, that's the kind of mindset I used to have until I became aware that I'm actually treating myself as a victim, right? Like, uh, you know, I used to have a job when I was in a very toxic for me environment and uh, I stayed there for quite a long time. And uh, I made myself believe that this is what it is. There is no better life for me. This is... Uh, the situation I am in, and uh, there is no way out. So I just have to suffer because I guess life is about suffering, right? That's what I uh, learned in school about the history of Poland, for example. Like, uh, life is suffering. Deal with it. Until I realized that I don't have to be in a situation that is toxic for me. I can get out of that and I am the only person limiting myself and I am the only one in control of my destiny. And anything else is just excuse because maybe we get too comfortable when we are in a certain situation. It's too familiar, even if it's bad, even if we feel that it kills us. That's the thing we know. That's the thing that feels comfortable. So it's hard to make a decision to change it. But I feel like you must realize that you have the power to change it. And once you make a decision, it can only get better. Yeah, you know, this taking, going back to the lines experiment, when the people, you know, the guy who was the innocent one, the one they were asking, in the interview after, he said, in the beginning, it was, uh, it was hard for me to like accept the wrong answer. But then I just gave him, like I, I couldn't help it. And he's like, I was so tortured, but I became tolerant of the torture. I was just, I became immune to the torture. And this reminds me of what you said, the suffering. There's a threshold of suffering. And when we pass that threshold, now the threshold becomes higher. So now suffering is the norm. And now you're just suffering every day. Yeah. And because you maybe forgot how it was to be two years old when you were, you know, like Zach or three years old, like Zach, suffering doesn't, doesn't mean anything. It's like suffering is like, oh my God, my sister took away my toy. And then you're good again in like five seconds. Now there is a chronic suffering that people suffer from. And I saw this firsthand in you, right? I, I saw it. I felt it with you. 
And getting out of a situation like that, if you're not aware you're in the situation, then how can you get out? Right. And also there are many other factors that we might not even understand. Because for me, even uh, going back to vet school for the five and a half years, and even in high school, it was a very stressful uh, environment for me, stress-inducing environment. And uh, I can imagine my cortisol levels were like up to the roof because I was constantly stressed out. And only now I am realizing that I was the person causing that. I was the one uh, choosing to react that way. I didn't have to do that. So even going back to the very first question that you asked me about the external environment, even if those people like the teachers, even if they were rude, it's up to me how I will react, right? But I was just... Uh, I guess very not aware of the power that I had. So maybe there are some traumas from the past, right? Maybe we get used to certain type of treatment or certain type of uh, reaction that we have and we think this is the norm and we might not see like, oh, there is uh, actually something else that we could do. Getting out of that awareness, though. If you're aware that you're suffering, and that is now your life, and it was your parents' life, and it was your grandparents' life, what separates someone who has hope and can get away from an environment like that versus someone who stays? Is there something that separates those two? Yeah, I would say the people who are close to you. Because if you see somebody close to you living an awesome, stress-free life, you're like, okay, I guess this kind of life is possible, right? So I had this with you because uh, I decided to change my life, uh, get out of the toxic environment um, shortly after I met you. And uh, that was a huge, huge influence because I could witness you just being happy, enjoying life, and having that almost firsthand experience made me feel like, oh, I could be like that too. So there is a difference from People who are not so close to you and you think they have perfect lives versus a person who is very close to you. And you see this from a very close perspective. Like, uh, this is possible. You can live a happy life. You can live a stress-free life. You don't need to suffer. I would say this is maybe the biggest factor at least in my experience. Seeing it firsthand. Yep. At least, even if it's one person. Yeah, and same thing, for example, my sister is right now in uh, South Korea. She flew there uh, on her own. And uh, I know her because uh, I also have this kind of uh, personality, or I used to have it, like you are just... Uh, too stressed and many people would be stressed to travel solo to go to a foreign country for a few months right but my sister did it and I would hope that she saw me doing that first going by myself to Mexico and then she was like well if she can do it I can do it too so I don't know if that was uh, the reason or uh, if it had an impact on her but maybe subconsciously who knows right so sometimes our own actions can have a big impact on other people. For sure. Yeah. Tell me about your habits nowadays. Because um, all this the transformation, the health transformation, um, being in a different environment, coming from, you know, coming here from Poland and 
being in Tulum and for sure the environment is going to interact with your genes a certain way, turn something on, so, turn something off, it make you feel a different way. Are there habits day to day that you, if you don't do it, you feel that something is missing? Well, uh, first of all, I try not to have something like that because I don't want to be dependent on anything. So if anything is taken away from me, it's uh, again the stoic philosophy here, but if anything is taken away from me, I want to be okay with that. So I want to like stress this out that there, I hope, I believe there is nothing in my life that is like, oh, I have to do it. Otherwise I'm like, uh, I'm not going to uh, be fully living. Like for some people, you know, they say like, oh, I uh, need to have my coffee or I need to go to the gym because uh, otherwise uh, I feel like shit. Although I would say if I don't go to the gym nowadays, I feel like uh, there are some emotions that I need to express. So this is definitely something that is helping me out. But again, I don't want to ever be dependent on anything like that. So, um, but yeah, anyway, I keep my discipline as we already discussed and I try to have uh, pretty much the same schedule every day and also on the weekends. So uh, just same, same uh, time, uh, I mean, have food at exactly the same time every day pretty much. Uh, that's one thing. I don't know if you would consider that a habit or not. Uh, going to the gym around the same time. Then when we are at the gym doing the cold plunge, uh, this is a habit for, I don't, I don't know, like about two months for me now. Uh, reading books. In the morning I read uh, philosophy and in the evening before going to sleep I read uh, fiction. Uh, right now I'm uh, reading Tolstoy. And... Uh, yeah, it's also kind of new for me. I think I started that about uh, three months ago, but uh, it's a really cool thing to do. And actually, I uh, used to not read so much and uh, I would just watch uh, Netflix, you know, or uh, scroll social media. But uh, I have realized that I want to do more th of uh, things which are intentional and remove um, any sort of like randomness from my life. So like going into Netflix and watching something that is recommended to me, I want to remove that from my life. I want to have, uh, intentional actions. So for example, I know I'm going to read this book. This, uh, will benefit me in this or that way. So whenever I feel tempted to do something like the social media scrolling or watching Netflix, I just think, okay, I'll just read a book. So this is, I believe, a really good habit to have. The fact that you keep going back to the book, right? Because sometimes you'll, let's say someone decides to start reading. They read for a month and then they're like, nah, this is not for me. I don't really want to read it. Right? Or let's say they start doing the ice bath and then after a few times, they're like, nah, you know, this is not really for me. But the fact that you continue to read, continue to do the ice bath, is that an indication that this is something aligned with your body? Can this be something that a, a person can, like, I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of times people ask me these questions like, uh, Doc, why do you do the ice bath? Right? And, uh, it's like a weird question because I never ask myself these types of questions. So I don't know. People ask people ask themselves all the time. And uh, my general answer inside, like, you know, I, I may not answer this out loud, but the general answer is, well, I did it once. I did it again. And I did it again. And then I did it again. Must be good. Well... I would say also sometimes you will not see any effects right away and you just got to continue doing stuff. But um, I would also say something about, I mentioned already like uh, my higher self and my lower self, just 
don't even allow those questions to appear. Like if you've done your research and you know the cold plunge, the ice bath is not bad for your health, then just keep doing it and don't even let yourself question this. Just keep doing it, make it uh, your habit. And I also feel like uh, this uh, could also potentially make you relax because you are telling yourself, hey, I got this. I don't need to make any decision what to do today because I'm doing the same things every day. So I would say you're totally removing stress from your life, right? Like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't have to think if I will do that or that, you know? I've had a very interesting relationship with the reading in my life. When I was in high school, we were told to read all these fictional books, right? The Great Gatsby, To Kill a Mockingbird, Great Expectations. None of, none of the told story Dostoevsky, unfortunately. But we read like American, American authors. And I was reading them so I can get good grades. I didn't really. Well, care. same, same. <laughs> yeah. was, ah, fiction, fiction is stupid. Yeah. And then there was a different feel of reading because now it was like science books. Right or like books from people who I really love, like Ramachandran, these guys. And then once I stumbled on Jordan Peterson, he said that people who have had a science background, more analytical background, quantitative background, they lack a liberal arts education. And so I was like, wait, that's me. I, I really lack this music, art, beauty, right? going to museums, reading fiction. And so this was about five years ago. I made a decision that, you know what? I'm going to get my liberal arts education now. Right? At the age of 36, I'm going to start now. Because liberal, according to him, and now I'm believing this more and more every day, a liberal arts education is fundamental to life. Because when you learn about history and you learn about philosophy, you get different perspectives on how to live. Oh, Epicurus lived this way. Oh, sh shit, like Stoicism teaches something different. Yeah, I think even uh, Seneca in one of his letters, he mentioned that liberal arts are beyond everything else. They're like... Uh, top one thing any anything else doesn't matter wow exactly what you just said wow wow so you'll get to that i will this is it's in letters yeah yeah very soon yeah i didn't read all of letters i read just the, the cool ones that uh ferris recommended i would just print out the pdf and read them back in the day so martha tell me about um your relationship to reading now that you're reading Stoic philosophy and Tolstoy, and I know your mom is big into reading as well, and she's read like all the books that we want to read that are on the sure. shelf right now, and she's read everything. So growing up and with the influence of your mom and having that intellectual bookish person in the house with the bookshelf and you know was seeing that as, as, a, as, a, as a child, you didn't really... Like those genes didn't get turned on very early, did they? True. Um, I would say maybe early, like in the elementary school, I did read a lot. Also, the uh, internet was not really there. I think uh, we got internet when I was like maybe eight years old. So before that, I was reading. And also when we already had a computer, I was also reading quite a lot, but then uh, the internet started growing and, you know, Netflix and TV, everything else. Uh, it was a uh, easier sort of uh, easier to access entertainment. So I kind of strayed away from the books. And then when I went to high school, I was forced to read particular books for school. Then when I went to vet school, I didn't really have time to read for pleasure, even though I did a little bit. Uh, I still remember I was getting books from my mom. She, she's got tons and tons of books. Um, but then when I started working, I 
did not have time at all. And uh, I only had time for uh, audiobooks whenever I was like, you know, cleaning my apartment or uh, running some sorts of uh, errands I could listen. And uh, only now that again, I have time to just sit down and read. Uh, as you said, those genes got turned on, right? And uh, also the moment when you brought the first uh, books uh, to us after uh, visiting your parents, uh, it was like a, a huge, huge moment when I was like, oh shit, we have those real books, we can touch them and we can feel them. And uh, it's just incredible, right? So I felt that magic and uh, also seeing you read inspired me as well so uh, yeah and then I realized that actually all the things that I'm doing which are pretty random and not really important can be removed and instead of doing that again an example scrolling social media or uh, watching Netflix this can be removed and replaced by reading books which have value for me so yeah, for example, I uh, removed my Facebook app. I am uh, limiting Instagram to minimum. Uh, and recently I realized that, well, I don't really even want to watch Netflix. So, yeah, I feel like uh, it's a really a breath of fresh air when I can just uh, take a book and be with it. Yeah, I will tell you one thing. I was pleasantly surprised when I saw your face, when I brought those books in, yeah. because I know I feel love for the books. Like I'm, I'm like giddy about them. I like, like a kid, like, oh my God, you know, my mom gave me the gift card for Barnes and Noble. He, she's like, here, go buy whatever. Uh, I love, I always loved bookstores. My God. And s seeing that when I brought those books, seeing your eyes as we were like unpacking the books, one by one. When we get a new book in, you yeah, come. Yeah, any time a book comes, I'm so excited. And then you go put it on the shelf, right? That ritual. Let's go back to the physical aspect of things. If we look at technology, right? We look at progress in the world. Is it technology taking us away from physical and into virtual? So, for example, before... There were people talking to each other. Socrates, right? He never wrote anything. He refused to write. He's like, it's, it, that's like going to make my memory worse. I'm not going to write. I want to remember everything. So that was very intimate. It was physical. The people were standing around. Then we figured out how to write, you know, paper and, and you know, the papyrus and shit. They were writing on that stuff. Now we have audiobooks. God knows what's going to happen in the future. What is your, because you read so many physical and audiobooks. So is, are, are we bastardizing the book culture by listening to audiobooks or, or giving a shit about audiobooks? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't really have a, have an opinion on that but what I can say is I do feel different when I uh, listen to an audiobook uh, versus reading a physical book because to me I mostly listen when I am doing something else like washing the dishes uh, cooking uh, whatever so it's like I am not giving a proper respect to the book in a way you know because I'm like uh, kind of multitasking so uh, whereas when I just read a physical book I'm forced to just be with it do nothing else so it's like uh, I am respecting the the author in a way right not uh, doing it like oh whatever I'm just doing a few things uh, at once uh, getting shit done you know so but I, I don't know about your question hard for me to say but there is a difference in uh in how i feel like uh, i feel like i get more when i read physical books because there's also something about you can go back to a certain paragraph uh when 
you can uh, rewind also in an audiobook, but it's just not uh, it's not the same, I would say. Because podcasts are different, right? Let's say two people are talking to each other in a podcast. Or let's say there's a video like Andrew Huberman. It's just him talking about. I just today I heard his cannabis. I finished the cannabis lecture, and I learned learned so much from him. Right, but he's talking solo. Now, if he were to if he were to write a book, I would read the book. And I used to only listen to audiobooks. That's it, because I would or Kindle. I would Kindle read. I wouldn't get the physical book. It would be like a Kindle thing. Because I was under the impression that I can read books faster by listening to them. Way faster. Yeah, that's right? true. So I would try to get through, you know, listen at 2x, 3x, whatever. In fact, the first two times I attempted to read Crime and Punishment, it was audiobook. And a little bit of it, I would like go back, but I had the PDFs so or like audio, um, you know, physical, like like not physical, but PDF, but it wasn't physical in my hand. And the first time I finished this book fully was when it was physical. I don't know. It's it's very interesting. Like it, it takes me back to the book um, Brave New World. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've probably read like a third of it. And in this book, it's it's like a dystopia book, right? It's like 1984. And in this book, I particularly remember that the government was trying to limit sexual activity, like basically to zero. And people were forbidden to have sex with each other, right? And I, I saw that and I was like, very, very interesting. Like, then I look at, okay, where, where is humanity headed? From hunter and gatherer society, when we were with each other, Right? We hunted together. We saw each other. We woke up next to our family. Then we look at, you know, agriculture came in. So that, that produces a hierarchy. Because in hunter-gatherer society, maybe there's an alpha male, but it's not like this guy is 100,000 million times richer than the, the poor guy. No, they're basically all equal. They're trying to survive and eat. They're trying to basically just live. And then you look at how knowledge is passed what forms of knowledge, right? We have, first we talk. Even before speaking, there was singing, right? Eric Jarvis talked about this with Andrew Huberman. He was saying that human beings or just the, the primates learn to sing and dance before speech. That's like a, something, a precursor. You told me about this. Very, very interesting. So we have even more primitive structures where we can feel language, right? They, there's a Stanford experiment which showed that 93% of communication is nonverbal, right? It's like yeah. how the person moves their hand, how they're looking at you, are they asking a question or are they making a statement, right? There's all these nuances to tonality. So I feel that there is a tendency where how the homo sapien is using technology, we are moving towards something that is away from deep communication, deep contact, human to human. Definitely. That love, that association, that feeling of intimacy is slowly going away. That's exactly right. I have the same feeling. So how could we do that? How could the, is that good for our survival? Is this, because I always, you know, there's this philosophy that says everything natural is good. There's, there's a philosophy like, oh, it's natural. It must be good. And that takes into account that what is natural is good for nature. But when we killed the Neanderthals, whatever, however many million or hundreds of thousands of years ago, the nature of Neanderthal was different from us, right? I, I read this in the book Sapiens. Basically what happened, according to you all, Noah Harari, the author, Homo sapien 
have the ability to tell stories that are fictional and they are believed by a vast number of people, right? So if you look at the story of Christianity, the story of Islam, the story of democracy, the story of communism, the story of anything, it can be believed by billions of people. And there is, a, there is a certain aspect of the homo sapien brain that is very different from the Neanderthal brain. Whereas in the Neanderthal brain, they may have been able to get in a tribe of, of, of a few tens, maybe 50, 50 Neanderthals could believe one thing. Maybe a hundred Neanderthals could believe one thing, but not a billion. So the Neanderthals did not have this capacity to believe in one thing and believe what every this billion people believe so they got killed so this is the yuval's thesis one of the one of his theses in the book that the reason we survived and the neanderthals didn't is because we can believe fictional stories at scale mm. does it also relate to democracy for example like we are able to just believe one person that one person got us, you know, they, they got us, they got our back. You think so or no? In a democracy, if you believe that a democracy is one person has my back, then why can't that be communism? Because in Russia, they believe Putin has their back, right? In a monarchy, they believe the king has their back. Because in the world today, most of the world, if you really look at it, like the third world, is basically like a monarchy, more or less. Maybe they may not call it a monarchy. But until the United States, basically everything was like that. Yeah. A queen or a king. Even just uh, those kind of systems, that may be something that differentiates us from the other species, right? that we are able to have those systems and have some people rule and everybody else agrees that this is the right thing. And there is no, like, fighting. I mean, there is, but uh, within one society, right? People will not fight because, okay, we agreed this is the right thing to do. And there is no chaos. So that belief in the story I feel like it kind of relates to that too. That's a very interesting point. Sapolsky talked about this in the last chapter, Us Versus Them, chapter 13. He said that the more intra-group conflict there is, right, so within the group, the more you are sensitive to attack because you're busy. You're busy talk, You're busy fighting each other. And the lower the intra-group conflict, the more likely you are to attack others. This is like scientifically proven stuff. Studies have been done in different species about this. And it's essentially that imagine a country who is very united and they all have a very common set of beliefs. It's very likely that they will attack another country. A tribe who has the same set of beliefs with each other and they're aligned, it is more likely that they will attack another tribe and try to convince the other tribe that they are right and, and the other tribe is wrong. Right. Very, very interesting point you made. I just feel with AI, with ChatGPT, with Neuralink, What's the point? Where are we going here? Hard to say, but it's like when you look at the history in general, we just keep evolving. And uh, that's the thing about human nature. Because many years ago, you would say, oh, why are they building the plane? Right? And now it makes our lives so much easier. So I remember... Uh, long ago, I read something about like uh, 
how right now people would be shocked about like marrying a robot, but our grandchildren would not be shocked at all. It's a normal thing. So this is how we evolve as species. But what's the point? I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is how I feel spending time in the digital world versus spending time in nature and uh, having contact with people through the internet versus uh, a personal contact. And uh, the former is so much better for me. And I, I just feel that internally, that it makes me feel at peace. So not thinking about this uh, in a collective way, about uh, community and uh, society, just thinking about it uh, from my personal perspective, I want to spend as, uh, you know, uh, not, not a lot of time in the digital world because it just doesn't serve me well. One thing that I learned from you is how to appreciate beauty. When we are biking, you look at the sky and you tell me, hey, baby, look, have you seen the sky? It's, it's pink or orange or pastel. Yep. And now I'm beginning to see the beauty in nature. I'm beginning to see the beauty in a tree or a flower, right? Because in the past, it would be more of an intellectual pursuit, right? Look at these ants, right? It would be like, I wonder what is happening in their brain yeah. and what spiking activity is happening versus... Yeah, like the, what are the receptors they're using, right? Precisely. Right. So can we put a micro electrode into the ants? I'm sure they've done it, you know, like a nano electrode in the brain. And then we record activity. Now I still have massive curiosity in these, you know, the neural mechanisms, but I'm beginning to see the beauty of it. And I'm beginning to take a step back and see nature without dissection, nature without reduction. So tell me how, how is, how, how do you feel about the mechanisms of something versus the overall picture of something? So for instance, let's say uh, obesity, simple example, obesity. A lot of people are obese. Well, you got two options. One, you make a society that is not obese by following societies that are not obese. Because not the whole world is not obese, obviously. Many societies in the world are fit. Many cities in the world are fit. The other side of that is, no, 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 no. Let people be obese. It's all good. Let's find the mechanisms of obesity. Let's find the genetic mutation or the variant or the enzyme that we can target to cure, reverse obesity. Mm. I don't like this approach at all. The second one you mentioned, it just, uh, it never felt right to me. Even all of this, uh, you know, uh, genetically modificated organisms uh, and stuff like that. It, ever since I started learning about it uh, when I was in, like, in high school, it never felt right, just for some reason. Even though I am, uh, I love science, right? And uh, obviously, I was uh, educated in uh, science, but it just doesn't feel right. And things like that, I would always just follow nature and not try to play God, you know? Because I don't know if that's the right approach, right? But that's just what I feel like. That's why I also really, really pay attention to how I take care of my health, because I would say it's better to prevent it, prevent a disease than to cure it later, as I believe you also agree with. Absolutely. It comes down to intent at the end of the day, right? So when, whenever I'm watching a Huberman lecture and he gets into mechanisms, I'm never thinking, oh, this mechanism will allow us to make a pill Right. I also never think about it that way. But that's where science is going. 
that's the whole point of the pharmaceutical industry. That's the right. whole point. Right. I was even thinking about this yesterday. I think after you mentioned that, it was like uh, creating pills for happiness. Um, I also had this like uh, thought, thinking process in my head about where all of this is headed and I can see all of that happening, just us uh, creating more and more pills that will modify something. Right, right. Because even uh, the psychiatric drugs are kind of, uh, you know, working in, with the neurotransmitters and uh, depends on how you look at this, but it's also something artificial in a way, right? Something you mentioned yesterday about therapy, and um, we've talked in detail about SSRIs. Can you tell us your experience with SSRIs? What happened? You know, however much you're willing to share, it's up to you. What happened? Um, why you did SSRIs? Because so many people are doing SSRIs now. I think the the recent figures are, I think it's 75% of college students have done Adderall and Modafinil, Xanax, uh, Ritalin, Vyvanse, you know, these drugs for studying. It's a pretty high number. 75% is crazy. In the U.S., I mean. And the other thing is uh, depression medicine. I believe it's same number. About 70 to 75% of the medicine in the whole world is used by the U.S. So especially the United States is big into pharmaceuticals. How can we solve this with a pill? Let's sell more pills. Let's make let the, the guy take pills every day. So take us through your SSRI experience, why you did it, what happened that made you stop, and perhaps the importance of therapy. Yeah, so uh, I was taking SSRIs for, I believe, about a year, uh, more or less. And when I started this, I was in a really, really like a negative place in my uh, life. I was very, very vul vulnerable at that moment and I just didn't see another solution for myself at that time because I was just uh, dealing with a lot of anxiety and I felt like, you know, I'm the only one feeling anxiety and uh, I might not be able to just uh, function normally if I don't do something with that. And initially I wanted to just go to uh, therapy, but then uh, the therapist told me I might uh, go to, I might have to go to a psychiatrist as well. So I, uh, I went for a consultation and uh, I was prescribed uh, SSRIs. And uh, I found another psychotherapist as well, um, where, who, uh, then told me at the very end that I might not need the medication and she inspired me to stop taking them, which I am really, really grateful for uh, looking back at this now. So I really enjoyed being on SSRIs, uh, to be honest, because it just felt like I don't have to deal with all these emotions that I used to have. And I felt like I was just uh, feeling way more social, uh, more brave and uh, just uh, better as a person because I suddenly didn't have those thoughts that would stop me from taking action. And uh, it felt like uh, there's... Yeah, like there's basically nothing stopping me. I can do anything and uh, I don't have to deal with any negative emotions. And uh, yeah, I just felt like this was really awesome. But I also had uh, really terrible side effects of that. Um, so I also knew that this cannot last forever. So I thought... The earlier I stop taking these uh, meds, the better for me. 
And uh, that thought was always with me, like, uh, okay, this is fine, but uh, this has to end and it has to end soon. So when my therapist told me that uh, I'm, I'm doing well, I learned how to cope with the anxiety and uh, I learned how to use like mental tools to deal with uh, this kind of issues. I don't need the medication anymore. And uh, I just uh, stopped them. Like I was uh, uh, just changing my dosage, uh, trying to do it in a proper way and not uh, quit like a cold turkey because that would have been really, really bad for me. Uh, and still it was really, really bad. I remember having a terrible stomach ache and uh, almost feeling like dying uh, when I was reducing the dose, but uh, eventually it felt good. And it also felt good knowing that I am that person without the need of taking anything external, uh, you know, uh, you know what I mean, right? When I felt more brave, more social, but I knew it was because of the drug. And then after I stopped taking it and I still felt like that, it was really huge for me. It was like, wow, okay, I don't actually need this and maybe I never needed this. So uh, if I knew then what I know right now, I would have never taken these drugs, even though I know they could be a tremendous help. And uh, if somebody is in a really, really uh, mm. difficult position in their life, it's okay to take these drugs. It's understandable, but um, I wouldn't have taken it if I knew what I know now. And I never really needed them. What about the CBT? You mentioned today some breath work or some breathing exercises that your, te your, your therapist taught you. So what sorts of activities could someone do if they, are, they have anxiety? You said what you know today, if you knew it back then, you wouldn't have done it. So it's like a, something you had to learn by doing that, oh, this is a mistake, and that's fine. So what sorts of activities can someone do? Body activities or mental activities or emotional activities that would be better than SSRIs? Hard for me to answer that because I would say it involves rewiring your whole brain and changing everything about your life because I feel like I am so much different than the person I was, uh, how many years ago, four years ago. And, uh, it's, it's really hard to judge, you know, because if somebody is not where I am right now, they might not get it and it might be really hard for them, but, um, what I have right now is uh, a lot of mental peace and clarity and this sort of feeling that anything that happens, everything will be good, that nothing bad is really going to happen, nothing is going to destroy me, and that I will always be okay no matter what happens. And, uh, yeah, just being with yourself a lot, doing breath work, meditating, going deep into your spirituality and not running away when you feel a difficult emotion, not trying to get rid of that. Because I feel like uh, in my case, and uh, my probably biggest issue and the reason why I decided to uh, seek help at uh, that point in my life was the strategy of running away from difficult things 
and situations. So I had this mechanism that whenever something seemed hard, I felt like, uh, you know, fight or flight. I would just always uh, choose flight, just run away and be happy that uh, you didn't have to face your fear this time. But then again, I would start worrying about the next thing that was going to happen. And then, oh, I, ru I uh, ran away again. So the therapy helped me a lot to just face difficult situations and just do things that seemed hard because I will be okay no matter what happens. So just changing that strategy from running away to facing the difficulties. And I feel like uh, we even discussed this recently, the or I read this somewhere, but I think we discussed this. When you go into social media because you want to avoid something, because you just want to numb the pain that you have instead of going into it and discovering what it really is. So I would say this is really important. And, uh, you know, the, the other tools like breathwork, meditation, it helps. But you got to know what is inside you and what are the feelings that you are experiencing. It reminds me of what Seth Godin once said. He said, uh, you have to get really good at being bored if you want to become a good writer. That was his number. Yeah, you told me that recently. Yeah, so I want to um, get into the topic of the giving a fuck about what other people think. This is a big one. This is huge. This is something that I've seen in you. Right, so um, for a very simple example is us using a ball at Digital Jungle, okay? And I've also felt this a little bit from Jameson, right? Because I remember, I told you the story where Jameson was feeling a bit, um, what will other people think? I remember th breath. this shocked me, to be honest, because I never thought that he, out of all people, would think that. But yeah, it's just a normal thing to feel, I guess. But uh, in these aspects, I I don't feel like, I don't feel weird. It just feels normal to do strange stuff. Yeah, because because it's interesting. Like, th I think there are for me personally, there are levels of not giving a fuck, right? And certain levels are toxic, whereas other levels are even worse than toxic because then you won't do what you want to do. So let me give you an example. Breath work. The first level is I want to do breath work in front of people and be weird and like move my body and, you know, move, move stuff, right? And uh, lie on the floor, lie on the ground, touch my body everywhere, you know, tap my balls, which I do. Right, all this stuff. So the first level is, I don't want to do this. And actually, the first level is, I don't want to do this anywhere. Because the first time I talked to my dad about prostate massage, he was freaked the fuck out. He wanted to change the topic right away. Because he knows it would involve him fingering his ass, right? I have no problem doing that at all. In fact, when we were at strength camp, I don't know if I probably told you this, Jibin was the neurosomatic therapist who came to the strength camp all the time. And he's like, you know, Farhan, I want to give you a prostate massage. Let's see, you know, let, let's see, uh, you're going to feel really good about it. I'm like, yeah, sure, let's do it. So, uh, so we were at the massage table at strength camp. Door was open. Anybody could have come in, right? Because the doors were always open. And I was living there, so it was, I, it was my, my room. And, you know, he told me, get on your back. And he started going in my ass with his finger. And he had a book in, open in front of it. It was a book with pictures and everything, right? Like all the uh, anatomy. And it was demonstrations in the book. So he would like flipping the page and he would doing this. And I was feeling pain, <laughs> like massive pain. And, and he's like, yeah, no, no, it's good you're feeling pain, man. Because, you know, because you're not like you're not getting fucked in the ass all the time. So this, it's good that you're feeling pain. You have a tight ass. And um, so he would go in there and 
I was like, ah, it's guy's probably an expert, right? Because he's <laughs> looking at a book and he's he's going in there. So I'm feeling a lot of pain. I'm sc literally screaming. And then he goes, oh, shit. You're supposed to be on your back. Uh, uh, you're supposed to be on your stomach. Oh, my God. And I'm like, oh, Jesus no Christ. wonder. So wait, now I'm on my stomach. And he's going at it. And it's still hurting me so much. And he's like, oh, sorry, sorry. You're supposed to be on your side. Jesus, that really happened. This really happened. Now I'm on my side. And now he's sure, right? And while he's in my ass, you know, going like this with the prostate, prostate, right? He's, he's massaging it. And I trust this guy, right? Like, I don't get, at that moment, I didn't give a fuck. If somebody walked in, fuck you, whatever. We're not doing anything wrong. And he's, uh, he's giving me a prostate massage. He's going like this. It feels good. It's feeling good. And uh, I'm like, dude, this is, you're so good at this. And he's like, it's the first time I'm doing it. It's, I was his first prostate massage victim. Yeah, you know, even this feels weird when you tell me that. It's like, it, it feels very out of the ordinary. Like, uh, that's, that's some weird shit. But uh, who am I to judge, right? This is very interesting because it didn't feel weird to me at all. I think the fundamentals of not giving a fuck is how much do you believe in what you're doing? So that guy, the 25% of people who didn't listen to the other six in the lines experiment, they believed in themselves. I know the benefit of a prostate massage. Mm. I know it in my gut. Every cell in my body is aware of what a prostate massage is and how good it will be, be for me. When Jibin finished the prostate massage, I got up and he's like, Farhan, do a few squats. Uh, baby, those three or four squats I did were the best squats I've ever done. And I felt so light and mobile. Uh, okay. My blood flow, because he told me the reason this is the case, because there is a muscle, the QL, something lumborum, quad, quad lumborum. There's a, there's a muscle QL, which is easier to access from the ass than it is from the hip from the from the adductors and he accessed it through the ass he's like this is why you feel so good doing a squat yeah that reminds me of the rectal examination in a cow like when you can access and feel like the baby cow through her ass wow let's go into that tell us some of the shocking um or some of the i guess some of the more memorable <laughs> uh, vet school situations. My favorite, I think, something that I <laughs> thought about right away is uh, my friend uh, Nadia uh, masturbating a horse. And I think my other friend did this too, but it was like uh, we were uh, collecting his uh, sperm uh, for examination and somebody had to do it. Right, so that was a, that was a really memorable thing for sure. We'll never forget that. How do you do that? Uh, well, I will not tell you the whole procedure right now. I don't remember. Uh, but th there's like some equipment you have to use, uh, something like a, mm, like a fake pussy that uh, I think you pour wa hot water into it. Uh, it's like a balloon, like a. It's hard, hard for me to explain, but uh, it will imitate the pussy and uh, then the horse will want to ejaculate into it. Ah, so you can't just show... Oh, uh, and uh, you have a mare standing right by the horse so he can smell her. And then you put this thing, uh, you know, uh, you put his dick into that and then he ejaculates. There you go. That's what I was about to ask. Porn. Like, can you show the horse stuff? And it kind of, you are. With yeah. The yeah. Also, I remember there was a lot of fun stuff uh, 
with uh, the farm animals for sure. I remember we once visited a farm uh, wh where they were uh, taking the sperm from um, from the bulls, and uh, there was like a fake cow, like a, how do you call it, like like a robot robot cow, sort of, and the. Uh, them seeing seeing her they were like jumping on her and then they could uh take the sperm from them wow this is interesting it reminds me of harry harlow because the physical touch in this case and we talked about physical touch all the time i mean the whole podcast we talked about this right the mother that the macaque went to was the one with fur not the one with the bottle. It was with out of the 24 hours, it was with the other mother, like 23 hours of the day with the furry mother because he could touch her and he could touch the, he could get physical comfort from her. That's so interesting. It's like we're so, uh, <laughs> physical touch. When we look at animals, what, what, and I know you're studying signals a lot, right? Like the signals that animals, uh, emit and what we can recognize as humans what myths or incorrect signals are there or like what what misinformation is there in the world about the signals animals give off oh this reminds me of something that I read yesterday actually uh, because I am uh, about to write a paper for uh, animal psychology uh, postgraduate degree. And uh, I am writing about the signals sent by animals to uh, people. And yesterday I read a research paper which was examining the misinformation about the signals sent by dogs uh, that mis misinterpretation of these signals by children. Uh, and what they found out is that the like four or five year old children, they I think uh, they examined uh, in many different uh, age ranges, but the little children, they get the signals completely wrong and that's why there is such a high percentage of uh, dog bites in our society uh, because for example when uh, we see a dog showing his teeth in like a very aggressive way we intuitively know he's going to bite but the kid will be like oh he's smiling at me legit i i read that yesterday like oh he's smiling or when you see um, a dog is putting his tail between his legs, like looking really small, he's like very scared and might attack because of the stress and because of uh, because he's so scared. The kid could interpret this as, oh, he looks so sad. I want to go and hug it. That was so interesting for me because uh, I feel like I know a lot about these uh, this sort of signaling naturally uh, spending a lot of time with dogs uh, from a uh, very young age and also studying veterinary medicine i know when a dog is about to bite or when he is scared but a kid thinking like oh he's so sad i want to hug him it was shocking to me yeah there were a few more signals that were completely misinterpreted and that's why the kids get a uh, bit Wow. In my culture, we were always told to stay away from dogs. Because when where I grew up in Karachi, when I was a kid, there was a jobra near where we lived. A jobra is, um, what's the word in English? It's like, a, 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 it's like basically homeless people, but they've made huts out of wood and uh, cardboard type stuff. Like basically, it's like little, little huts and it's called a Jopra. And uh, very, very poor people live there. And there was a dog. Uh, we call it a Pagal Kutta. The dog is Kutta. Pagal is like crazy. Crazy dog. <laughs> Pagal Kutta. That, that dog. So there were stories that, oh, this dog bit this guy and gave him rabies. He bit this guy and took him to the hospital. 
which is a fair concern, I would say, because, uh, you know, even the Tulum uh, stray dogs is completely different than what we are used to in uh, Western cultures, right? They are very unpredictable in their actions compared to dogs that are kept as pets ever since they were born. So, yeah, it's still an animal and you really can't ever trust. Uh, another thing that uh, I just remembered about these uh, signals is uh, when dog is stressed, he might uh, lick his nose. Uh, it's like the it's like a compulsion in a way, right? Like, uh, you know how animals sometimes do certain actions uh, because they are st stressed out and they themselves might not even realize that they are doing it. So if they uh, use this kind of signal, the kids think, oh, uh, he just has something on his nose, uh, something like uh, some food. So he's licking that. It's, it doesn't mean anything. And the kids will not expect that the dogs are about to attack or getting stressed out. Or if a dog is like panting, sometimes it might be a sign of a huge stress. And the kid will think, oh, he's just uh, tired. But the, the thing that I mentioned first, like, he's really sad, I have to hug him. And like... Uh, when the, he's showing his teeth in an aggressive way and the kid is like, oh, he's smiling at me. That was super shocking to me to learn that yesterday. Parents have to be careful when they go to a different country where there are a lot of stray dogs. Like in Tulum, if someone comes here from Boston with their dog, from LA with their dog, they got to be smart. Of course. With, with their dog and with their kids. And we know what happened with Antonio's dog got bit by the other dog. So yeah. they have to be careful with your kids and your dogs. Yeah. And even if you don't have kids and uh, other pets, if you're on a scooter, we know this also firsthand. If you're on a scooter, on a bike, or even in a car, the dogs might just attack. Why is that? You tell me. Why? Because humans are like this too, obviously. Like... I'll give you a simple example. In the social isolation experiments of Harry Harlow, he isolated animals from anywhere from three to 12 months, and then he introduced them, reintroduced them, into, not reintroduced because they were never introduced, they, he introduced them into society, normal society. And one of the results he got was that the socially isolated, purely socially isolated, because some of them were like six months normal, and then they were isolated. So they were like at least knew what the environment was before they were isolated. But a lot of them were isolated from literally three hours after they were born. They were taken mm -hmm. away from the mothers. When they were reintroduced into society, they would become aggressive towards someone they should not be aggressive towards. So for example, a little bitch, little dog, I mean, in this case, a, a macaque, a monkey, if he's being aggressive to the alpha, who is three times as big as him, then he would get demolished. But he would do it. So they had an incapability of reading when to be aggressive and when not yeah. to be aggressive. Yeah, and uh, this is actually so so. How do you call? How do you say it? Social socialization. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, it's it's really important, and I know this uh, about dogs because we were uh, breeding dogs with uh, my parents, and uh, there is a certain age uh, of a puppy that he needs to get familiar with his environment, with other dogs, with people, with uh, loud, like loud streets, and uh, stuff like that. And if it's not done correctly, the dog will have uh, behavioral issues. And uh, I would say it's the same with uh, other species as well, right? So it's all about acting accordingly with this protocol of introduction to different sorts of um, things, I would say, like, uh, how, do you, how do you say it? Impulses. But it's not, the dog is 
stray? Is it that he's not getting love? Well, if he was living with people since a young age, there would be no problem. Okay. But since they are not living with people, it's a different story. What about barking? In Tulum, we see dogs barking all the time, even if they have owners and they're living with people. What's up with that? That's normal? Yeah, that's just uh, but the some, way they communicate. But some barks don't bark. Some dogs don't bark. Like in America, if I were crossing the street, I wouldn't have a dog well, barking. Well, it's, it's uh, one thing, it's uh, how they are brought up. And another thing is a personality. Also, dogs might have different personality. Or they might also have traumas, right? Something uh, bad happened to them when they were puppies. And it's the same thing as uh, with humans. Sometimes you have to work with a trauma of a dog. And that's why uh, you have animal psychologists. Empathy. I've never seen animals as humans. And now I have way more empathy for animals than I used to. And I know Sapolsky talks about this all the time, you know, how he felt about when he first started, what, what type of mindset you have to have when you work with monkeys and stuff. But in general, whenever a, one of our technicians would cry after we had to euthanize a monkey or w once a monkey got sick, or could not, we couldn't do experiments on the monkey. I mean, I would be crying because I couldn't do the experiments and get data. She would be crying because the monkey's sick, right? So seeing the treatment of animals firsthand, because I was doing that myself, and there were a couple of horrific situations that happened in the lab, which I was a part of. And the I didn't have empathy at all, like almost zero like a sociopathic person, psychopathic person. I was thinking, these animals are there to give me data. Like Harry Harlow type, right? You, oh, socially isolate them, sure. And I know with Harry's story, he would on purpose tell the lab to keep the horrible stories away from him. I don't want to know. Because he knew that if he got emotional, this stuff would never happen. Now, you as a lover of animals, someone who sees the beauty of an animal, can feel the pain of an animal, right? Like two days ago when we saw Antonio and his dog, Chino. Chino got bit by some dog, at you know, that, that girl's dog. And Chino was devastated. You were devastated. I tried to feel emotion for the dog. I tried to feel my feminine side. But I had to try. It wasn't automatic. Like I couldn't like feel the dog's pain. Right. I had to force it, try it. What what is that? Like, does that make me heartless, evil? Because if I felt any sort of empathy for those monkeys when I was doing experiments on them, I would not have gotten my PhD. There's zero chance. And my boss, Chris, in our, in our interview, it was like a one-hour interview, he said, hey, listen, you're going to have to go work with monkeys. Like, you're going to have to bring them to the cage. You're going to have to head fix them. You know, they won't be able to move their head. You're going to have to do surgery, you know, put, do craniotomies, put electrodes inside their brain, put an put a eye coil in their eye. You're going to have to do all that. You're good with it? I'm like, yeah, for sure I'm good with it. I felt proud that... I don't feel pain. I'm immune to this empathy because I'm such a great scientist. So I always saw emotion and empathy as negative when it comes to animals. But then if you have empathy towards your customers or towards your team, not real empathy, a forced empathy so you can get a result. If I act like I have empathy towards one of my employees and I say the things someone would say 
if they had empathy. Then they would think I have empathy. So tell me. So towards your employees, you don't have real empathy? Or have you taught yourself to have it? Sometimes I am so busy in my mind of what I'm doing that let's say a horrible thing happens. I remember one of one of the people um, they needed surgery, or they needed to get the the vaccine, or they needed uh, an advance because their children are uh, needing insurance, right, or needing a, needing some hospitalization. Now, in my mind, if I sit and think about this person, which I do, I get a certain empathy, but I can't fully feel their pain. I haven't trained myself or I haven't lived a life where, or maybe it's the genes that haven't been turned on, God knows, but I know that I don't feel the empathy that other people feel, like what Imran feels. I know I don't feel that because he feels it. I know he feels it. Jameson feels it. I know Jameson feels it. I have not fully surrendered to it, the surrender to it. And a lot of that probably has to do with my upbringing. I wanted to say that. I wanted to say that when you mentioned, like, uh, why don't I have empathy towards animals? And you mentioned that you never had a pet. The animals were not treated like family um, when you were growing up. So I would say it's a lot about the upbringing because I had a totally different experience. I was growing up surrounded by animals and uh, my parents were always showing a lot of love to our dogs and the cat and uh, they were treating animals like uh, part of our family. So that's why I see animals as that. You can feel their pain. Like when you saw Chino got bit in, in near his or in the nearest butt over there, in the lower back. And it was on his leg. A leg, yeah. You felt? Yeah, and so I saw his face. And uh, the way he was uh, crippling. It was... It just looked like he was in pain. I wonder... And that that's one thing that is uh, great about veterinary medicine. And... Uh, why it would excite me to do it if uh, I decided to do it. Just the uh, possibility to ease the pain. If you see the suffering, you have the tools to make it better. But there, there are a lot of nuances that you have to consider. For example, like, uh, you know, all these protocols and then uh, some kind of therapy might not be affordable for uh, the uh, clients, for, for the owners. And then uh, another issue are, for example, the owners not knowing how to properly take care of the animals. And you just feel hopeless because you know they're going to make the same mistake again. Like, for example, I saw uh, many examples of dogs uh, eating like ibuprofen which is toxic for them. And uh, it's just, it happens because of the negligence of people who don't know that it's toxic and uh, they don't really care enough to protect their dogs, which, which like if something like this happens, it's purely the owner's fault, right? Because the dog doesn't know any better. And uh, you have to sometimes face the fact that you might help this dog, but in the end, the owner is responsible for its life. And the owner has to take care of the dog outside of the doctor's office. And there is only so much you can do as a doctor, right? 
So there is a lot of responsibility, a lot of uh, education involved in that. And it's just uh, really, really difficult because there are so many things outside of your control, which uh, made me think that I would not be really happy if I was doing that. I wanted to find a different path for me, which is okay. I'm very happy that I realized that. I'm also very happy that I got this sort of education. It's very valuable. Um, but yeah, just uh, happy that I chose to do something different. Tell us about that. What What are you interested in now, present day? And how do you feel when you do that? Day to day. What's your, what do you love? What activities do you love doing? Well, first of all, I love going to the gym, uh, which is really, really interesting because I only started, I think, last year. Uh, and I never was a athletic sort of a person. And uh, I avoided the gym as much as uh, it was possible. But then I started doing that and you inspired me again. And uh, I'm just really happy that I'm doing that. And uh, another thing, I am currently learning uh, programming and uh, starting with uh, Python. But I also already have interest in uh, other languages I want to discover, um, other frameworks and just... Uh, see what I am interested in the most. And uh, I am very happy to be in a position when I ha where I have the freedom to explore what is uh, interesting to me and just go on this uh, beautiful adventure. So uh, this is what I do day to day. Um, I just enjoy the learning process because I am basically learning programming from scratch. And, uh, yeah, I just always really liked the analytical and uh, logical stuff. So going into that after working a little bit, uh, with, uh, customers and, uh, in general, uh, business kind of stuff I felt like oh I want to discover this uh, software world so that's what I'm doing right now but I'm also as I mentioned uh, continuing the animal psychology studies and uh, then as I also mentioned I'm just reading stuff that is uh, interesting to me. Was there a tipping point that made you decide to become a programmer, become a programming student? Um, yeah, it was kind of interesting uh, process because I always knew that there is something uh, that is like uh, programming, but I never knew what exactly it was apart from like learning HTML when I was really, really young. When I was maybe like 10 years old, uh, I was uh, writing HTML code in the notepad. Uh, so that was really fun. But apart from that, I never knew what uh, coding was. And uh, basically, when I was uh, working in uh, my previous jobs, I uh, encountered people who were programmers and uh, they were building the software. And uh, I just naturally got interested in that. I really wanted to know what exactly they are doing and uh, if it's fun or not, or if I would enjoy something like this. So I also knew uh, from like a more uh, financial perspective, I knew uh, it, it would benefit me if I could uh, have this skill but uh, right now I try not to think about it from this perspective and uh, just 
have fun with it. Because uh, it might feel frustrating if you're only starting something and you see a lot of people being really advanced in, uh, in that and you are just getting started. Does it really make sense to do it? But uh, then I tell myself, I just want to enjoy the journey. And that's what I'm doing. In this journey so far, when you are writing code, is there any thing besides the HTML at 10 years old, does it resonate with other things you've done? Like, oh, oh, this is like that. Oh, this seems like that. It reminds me a little bit of uh, just learning languages. And this is something I also love. Uh, and I feel like I've always been good at learning languages. Um, first, I learned English. I was also learning German. Uh, I even started learning a bit of Russian, Korean, Japanese. And right now I am learning Spanish because we are in Mexico. And uh, yeah, I always loved learning language. Also because uh, my mom is a translator and she knows uh, German and uh, Russian. Um, probably I have this kind of uh, genetic predisposition to learn languages as well. And uh, learning programming languages really does remind me of that a lot. We get inspired by our parents and we've both been inspired by our parents but sometimes we inspire our parents. So I know recently you gave some really great gifts to both of your parents. And now, and you also mentioned your sister being inspired, traveling and whatnot, getting out of her comfort zone. You gave them a gift, you, especially your dad. You gave him a gift recently. Tell us about that gift and what does that mean to you? Why did you do that? Well, um, I just had a an idea to gift him a some something concerning stoic philosophy um because i felt so good reading uh stoics every morning for i don't know 2 3 months now i felt like it was benefiting me tremendously and I felt like I want my dad to feel the same way. I want him to get this sort of happiness in the morning uh, when he starts his day. So I decided uh, I, I couldn't really find a good translation of uh, you know the, of the Seneca or uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, a good Polish version of those books. So I uh, found the uh, Ryan Holiday's, I don't know, I don't remember the exact uh, title of the book. It's something about the Stoic philosophy for every day of the year. And uh, you love Ryan Holiday. I, I read his, uh, one of his books, uh, The Obstacle is the Way. Um, actually listened. Uh, because I, I chose the audiobook version. And uh, I think we also listened to his interview with uh, Joe Rogan, and uh, I just really like him for some reason, even though I uh, didn't uh, read a lot of his books. So I trusted, uh, I had trusted him and uh, decided to get my dad uh, the book, for the Stoic Philosophy for every day of the year. And uh, just hoping that he could benefit from it in in some sort of way. And uh, he's reading that right now. And he's sending me photos of uh, each page that he gets every morning. Because I know he's probably not a big fan of reading. So this might be a really, really good uh, way of getting into that for him and uh, a good habit. Yeah. He may not be a big fan of reading now. Yeah. But the genes just have to turn on. 
Yeah, and uh, especially because we both, uh, you and me, love Stoic philosophy, and uh, we just keep uh, uh, reading to each other whatever we learned, and uh, I I just feel like it's uh, such a beautiful thing. Uh, I also wanted my dad to feel that. One thing that you felt um, coming to this part of the world is community. Right? You tell me about this all the time, and I want to get your perspective on if we compare cultures, and again, it's not to make a stereotype or some judgment, but certain cultures have a certain community, have a certain social vibe, an ambiance. And from your experience so far, if you compare Polish culture, where you which you were brought up in, and you are, but you are also Mexican culture. You are also American culture. You are also Ukrainian culture. Right? You've been to all these places in the world. And Canadian culture, right? You've experienced all of that. So were, were there any cultural shocks or differences or weirdities that you were like, wait a minute, my Polish friends got to see this. This is crazy. Not exactly that kind of uh, thought, but coming to Mexico was like a, like a breath of fresh air for me um, because maybe not Mexico, but Tulum in particular. And uh, you know this very well. Um, just feel so free. And there are so many weird and fun people out here that you just feel like you can do whatever. You can be whoever you want to be. Of course, as long as you're not uh, hurting anybody. Um, but you are free to express yourself. And in general, it just feels like people are more friendly and more carefree. And, uh, and it just makes you feel better. Because when I am in Poland, I feel like uh, there is a lot of seriousness. Also, I don't want to really generalize, but... The vibe, I would say, it's more like, uh, okay, let's be serious. We are in a serious community and uh, we got serious jobs to execute. Whereas in here in Tulum, it's more like, oh, you know, ah, it's whatever. Ahorita, uh, you even have people who, uh, who will get certain jobs done for you, but they're like, oh, okay, okay, whatever. And uh, it's, of course, it has uh, also uh, negative sides, but in general, it's way more chill. And I just feel way more happy in here. Also, it's uh, probably because of the climate as well. Because uh, half of the year, or maybe a little bit less, but... Uh, a huge uh, portion of the year in Poland, uh, it's dark, it's ugly outside, like uh, you don't really feel like you want to go outside because there's no sun. And here, all year long, you have the sun, you have uh, high temperatures, and you just feel like you are in paradise. So that's, uh, I feel like it makes a huge difference too. And about the things that really shocked me uh, as a European person is uh, for sure uh, first time coming to the United States and uh, seeing uh, the obese people being like a normal thing, which you don't really see in Europe. I haven't seen that in any European country. What I've seen in 
anywhere, basically, in the U.S. where I've been. It was shocking. And I don't mean to, obviously, um, think negatively about obese people, but I do believe that this is causing harm to health. So that was uh, really sad for me to see. Even though you were very immersed in Hollywood culture, I mean, you know more Hollywood than I do. Well, but uh, you don't really see that in Hollywood movies. Right. Do you? you don't see the reality. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they showed that. Because you wouldn't like America then, right? People would get a negative. Yeah, also, um, what, uh, another thing that shocked me is how in the suburbs you get all of these Wendy's, uh, KFC, Taco Bell, and uh, it's like a copy-paste, basically. And uh, it's all huge, but it's not nice. It's not like a beautiful scenery. You know what I mean? Where if you are in Europe, you have like a really, really nice views everywhere. Everything is uh, unique. And uh, in the US, I haven't seen a lot of it, but from what I've seen, it looks very much like copy paste, copy paste. You know what I mean? I do. We spoke about that, but Puro versus the hotels we stayed at in the U.S. Yeah. Huge difference. Speaking of beauty, I've always be a, been a proponent of function. Function over beauty. What can this thing do? So, for example, you have a plate in front of you. It could be beautifully organized. The You know, the vegetables here are very cutely designed and fruits here and meat here and all this. Or it's not beautifully designed at all. It's like, here, eat it. So I've always been a proponent, since I was a kid, of function. What does this do for me? So for example, whenever we would have a celebration in Jamaat Khanna, I would wear a, like a hoodie and jeans. Whereas everyone else would wear a suit or a shalwar kurta or some fancy, 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 fancy stuff. And I remember my parents and my relatives always sort of making fun or in a negative way, like, look at Farhan. Okay, again, he's dressed like this. What the hell is he doing? He's again dressed like this. And, I and always, it's like that even now. It's still like that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sort of like, I was sort of feeling sorry for them. Like, man, you guys are really dumb. Like, you guys are really into mm. this, like, looks thing. And you don't even get it because I didn't fully respect them because I don't, I never wanted to be like anyone in my family, really. I saw myself better than everybody. And so this concept of beauty and function is very interesting to me. And I would love to get your perspective. Like, for example, this room here. You designed it. You picked out a lot of things. You figure out how to pick out a lot of things for the apartment, right? And, you know, what lamps to get. Uh, you know, even how to decorate the bathroom. You know, you pay attention to little details. How to make things elegant and still minimal. And how would this match with the current configuration, right? You care about all these things. And I'm very happy that you do because... I don't have those, I don't have that propensity, that instinct. I have instincts for other things. So function-wise versus beauty, what is that? Is that a masculine-feminine thing? Yeah, I was, uh, I was just about to say it, like it's the feminine energy. But generally, I believe there needs to be a balance of both of those because if you only have beauty, doesn't doesn't really matter uh, if it doesn't serve its function. But if you only have function and there is no beauty, there you feel 
the lack of beauty. I could feel it. So there just always needs to be a balance, right? Because if we decorated this room beautifully, but it doesn't serve its function, what's the point? But if you just cared about the function and it was looking ugly, then something's missing, right? So always try to balance. This is one of the reasons why Elon built Tesla the way he does. He wanted to make a beautiful car because he could have made an electric car which was functional and running amazing. But he also wanted to make it beautiful because that's what people yeah. want. Compromise. And uh, that makes me think about the, what I mentioned at the very beginning, the sacrifice. Because you will many times not be able to have it all always. So choose what's the most important for you and sacrifice what's the least important. The concept of beauty makes me go back to our Instagram discussion. As a woman, did Instagram ever trigger you in a way that, oh, look at this person, I don't have what they have? Yeah. So many times I felt, I felt that. Was it? I feel like that's even the kind of the point of Instagram. To trigger that. Status. Status play. Yes. A lot of Sapolsky's literature that he talks about in the book in Behave is about this. He says, when we look at baseline cortisol, or you even look at testosterone levels in men, women too, it's, it's both, you don't get stressed in an absolute way. It's always relative. When you compare yourself with this person or that person, even if you are, from society standards, rich and famous and successful, but not as successful as your brother-in-law, right? Or your best friend or whatever, that defines... In humans, that defines our stress levels and our happiness. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, I feel like it's a really, really important thing to talk about. And uh, we also discuss this a lot, how you should not compare yourself to anybody but yourself. Just make sure that you are making progress. And that's all that matters. But I know the feeling of comparing myself to other people. Even with uh, programming, I feel like, oh, I'm only getting started. And how am I supposed to compete with all these people that have years of experience? But uh, one of the techniques that I have learned throughout my life is to just let go of negative thoughts. And this is how currently I deal with any kind of stress and anxiety. I just let these thoughts go. I don't even, it's like a no-go pathway. I just don't allow this to enter my brain. I don't want to dwell on these thoughts. So when I get this feeling of comparing myself to other people, I notice this thought and then I can be like, okay, let it go. Goodbye. And just focus on something else. But I definitely know that feeling. And I'm happy I don't really have that anymore. Because this is something that, uh, you know, you hear uh, everywhere. Like, you don't know other people's stories. You don't know what happened to them. You don't know their traumas. You don't know basically anything. So why would you compare yourself to them? It doesn't make any sense. You only know yourself if you're lucky, right? How can you focus on what you want to do in life and not have those distractions affect you? Have you undertaken any protocols or any systems or designed your life in a certain way which keeps you on track? Because there's a lot of distractions, there's a lot of noise, 
and negative thoughts might be the biggest noise of everything. And Instagram just makes that more prominent, right? It makes that stuff more, uh, um, it makes it more salient. Yeah. So first of all, what I just said, don't let any negative thought enter. You can feel the negative thought? Yeah. You can feel it. I can feel it. And it's you trust uh, that judgment. And many times I feel the ego just telling me, you are not good enough. You are not this or not that, or you are this or that, but in a negative way. Basically, the ego is always trying to label me in any kind of way. But also, there's uh, another thing about negative emotions where you shouldn't really suppress them. I would differentiate um, negative thoughts and negative emotions. I would deal with these things in a different way. But negative thoughts, I don't want to dwell on it. And I just want to let it go. Another thing, uh, what I told you about my schedule, I keep the schedule for every single day, what I'm going to do. This is how long it's going to last. This is what I'm going to accomplish. And uh, also I keep a plan right now for every week. And then I keep like a long-term plan, like what uh, things I'm going to learn, what books I'm going to read uh, about programming or other stuff so I can keep myself accountable. Because again, I don't want any noise to affect me. I want to have uh, an intention and a plan and act accordingly. But of course, if I need to be flexible, I can. But having a plan, uh, being your own manager in a way, it allows me to get closer and closer to my goals and remove things that are not necessary. But as I said, if uh, I meet somebody I know during the day and uh, we have a conversation, <laughs> sorry, conversation which is uh, spontaneous, I will not be like, oh, now on my schedule I have something else, so I need to run away from this person. Not at all. I want to have this flexibility. But then again, if I just want to take my phone and go on social media, I remind myself right away, hey, what are you doing? Is this going to bring you any value? And the answer is always no. Just get back on track. Because you can feel the negative thought. I always feel that. Whenever I open Instagram, I always feel like this is sucking my soul. And you got to trust that feeling. The last topic I want to get into is how do you balance, because this is something I've learned from you. You are tough. You're solid. You're tough. You're resilient. You, you see an obstacle and, and you may express the pain of it. You may express how sad it is or how angry it makes you or how frustrated it makes you, right? You express those emotions, but you are so tough that while you're expressing your emotion, while you have that feminine energy, you're still tough and you are resilient. You persevere. And we saw that in, in Merida when you had this massive allergy problem. And I saw it. I mean, I, I couldn't, Sometimes I couldn't bear to see it, right? And I did my best to console you and hug you and just whatever love I could provide. But at the end of the day, you were really suffering. But I still remember that you were tough. You're like, you know what? 
I'll just wear the mask in the house, whatever. I'll figure it out. I'll wear two masks. I will go outside sometimes, or we will just go to cafes. You are always solving, but at the same time, feeling. And I see this in very few people. It's very rare because in society, and this is me included, either you are practical and tough, but then you don't have emotion because it makes you weak. But then the other side is you're very emotional, you're crying, and you don't have any solid foundation on anything. So if you go back to your life and your if you can feel the wiring of your brain or the rewiring of your brain, how can you have both of those? Yeah, that's a really interesting thing and it right away made me think of uh, something that I used to think about myself, which uh, I'm not really uh, so deep into right now, but I used to, you know, uh, read about astrology, numerolo numerology, and uh, stuff like that, which uh, I'm not into uh, right now. Uh, but I used to think, you know, I'm a cancer. Uh, I, I don't think you are deep into astrology, right? So cancers are known for being very, very emotional. And it's basically the uh, most emotional zodiac sign that there is. And then uh, from the perspective of numerology, I'm number one. And one is a very, very practical uh, number. Uh, it means like you are the leader. You are the number one. So when I, uh, at the time when I was interested in stuff like that, it was like, I don't know, five years ago, I was always thinking like, yeah, that's exactly who I am. Kind of like uh, two different, completely different uh, things in one person. On one side, uh, very emotional. And on the other side, uh, on one hand, very emotional. On the other hand, very uh, practical. So uh, that's very interesting that you said that because I forgot about this. I was like never really interested in uh, astrology or uh, uh, numerology uh, since then. But now that you mentioned that, uh, it made me think of that. And uh, I was also contemplating that in the past, like how interesting that I am both very deep into feeling stuff. And at the same time, I feel very tough and uh, Hard to say. I don't know where that is coming from. From God. <laughs> For sure. Um, final question is about peace. We talk about peace a lot now. At least the last couple of days we've been talking about peace. And I know when we do our breath work, we do nasal breathing, we take deep breaths. Today you told me about a new system of breath work you were working on where we're breathing deeper and yes. slower. Yes. Yeah, and it happened, uh, it was very intuitive. And it happened two days in a row. Uh, yesterday and today, I did my last uh, session um, because I do 30, 30, 30. And the fourth one I did very deep and very slow. And both times it just felt divine. And I don't know why I did that. It just happened. But... Both times it was really, really great. There are certain moments which take us away from peace. And from my life understanding, it's when we are not playing. When we become serious and thinking about something in an ego way, a transactional way, what can I get out of this? Peace goes away from my experience because play goes away. What lessons have you learned when it comes to 
being at peace in your heart and has play and fun and uh, seeing the humor in something helped. Definitely. Definitely it helps. And you actually were the person who told me about this concept of playing. And uh, ever since you mentioned this to me first time, I have been thinking about this. And uh, even right now, I, in my programming, uh, what I do with programming, I feel like it's just uh, play and fun. I don't like to look at this from the perspective like, oh, will it uh, get me a great job? Will it uh, uh, allow me to make a lot of money? That spoils the fun big time. I, I don't like to think about these things. And uh, we talked about this a lot, us being in Tulum. We have so much opportunity to just have fun. And, you know, I don't mean that in a way of going to a party, getting drunk, but rather just uh, having fun during the daily activities, like going on the bike, um, going to the co-working, going to the gym, constantly just uh, playing and having fun. Because I just don't like it when things become serious unnecessarily. Why may, again, why make yourself suffer? Why make things difficult for you just for the sake of it being difficult? If it doesn't have to be hard, why make it hard? That's what I believe. That does allow me to have a lot of uh, peace of mind, for sure. And another thing is, uh, you know, there is this thing that a lot of stress is self-induced. Self -induced. Am I saying this correctly? Uh, like we are the source of our own stress. We choose to be stressed. And I read this a lot in uh, Epictetus right now. It's how you react to what is happening to you. It's not the external thing that is causing you pain or suffering in many cases. It's you yourself choosing to feel that. And uh, I think I even read this today. I wanted to read it to you, but you were busy. If somebody causes you harm, it's not harm unless you choose that it will be one. Something along these lines. You have to give it permission to get to you. And uh, there's a lot of uh, things like that that Epictetus mentions. Just care about what is in your control. Let go of everything that is outside of your control. Whatever depends on other people or anything external. Don't let it affect you. So I feel like this is a big part of getting that peace of mind. Whenever something happens to you, just slow down for a moment. As you said, just breathe for a couple of minutes and then get back to that situation and see what you think about it. You said this to me today and I also read this in Epictetus today. Thank you, baby, for your time, for the schedule, <laughs> fitting us in to your schedule, fitting this podcast into your schedule. Much, much appreciated. I know um, it took me a long time to get you here. <laughs> You're very welcome. And thank you as well, baby.